Okay, welcome everybody to the um, first quarter um, meningioma support group. Uh, and uh, I thought a timely topic um, would be to uh, give a presentation of how as physicians we walk, um, we walk our, our patients through the um, process of evaluation and treatment of meningiomas. Um, so this is, this is what kind of I think about when I'm seeing a new patient with meningiomas. And uh, I think it, it gives you kind of a glimpse into the uh, sequence of events that I try to process when I, I talk to patients. So I'm gonna um, kind of walk you through the, um, the step-by-step -step process. I, I use a, a series of seven steps. Uh, I also um, will give you some case examples at the end of, of some uh, patients with meningiomas and then show you kind of how we would apply these steps to each of those patients. Okay. So um, just by way of introduction, so this is Paul. He's a law student. He's uh, been diagnosed with a meningioma. And so when you when he first got this diagnosis, it was frightening. His grades are suffering. He's kind of withdrawn from his friends, and he's he, he really doesn't know where to turn. So he's trying to understand what options are for his situation, and he wants to understand kind of what's the stepwise approach to um, learning about um, meningiomas. So the be, before you can talk about you know, management of meningiomas, um, I wanted to have one slide specifically talking about the actual workup. Um, you can't, can't formulate a plan until you have a complete evaluation. So before you can consider management steps, let's talk about what studies are necessary um, to evaluate your meningioma. The uh, most common study and what nearly everybody has is a MRI scan. Um, generally, the MRI scan is done because you're having headaches or you've had a seizure or you've had a CT scan that showed something and the MRI scan is done to get a lot more detail. And these MRI scans for meningiomas are typically done with contrast. And, and uh, what, what that does is most meningiomas typically light up as a bright white spot on the MRI scan with the injection of the contrast dye. So uh, for the most part, MRI scans are, are the gold standard. Um, we're gonna pretty much focus on brain meningiomas during this talk, but um, if you have a meningioma of the spine, uh, which can happen, it's the same thing via the MRI scan of the spine rather than, than the brain. Now, there, there are two circumstances where we would also get a CT scan as part of the workup. Um, one, uh, and one is if the patient cannot have an MRI scan. There are some patients with um, pacemakers in um, for their heart that um, uh, are not MRI compatible. And so in those cases, we uh, will go with a high resolution thin slice CT scan. The other situation where we will use a CT scan rather than an MRI scan is if we are concerned about meningioma tumor invading into the bone. And the reason for this is CT scans are a lot more, um, give a lot more detail about bone anatomy than MRI scans. MRI scans are more visually appealing when you look at soft tissue such as brain, but CT scans are much better for bone involvement. Um, in addition, occasionally, if you're going down the surgery route, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but if you're going down a surgery uh, resection uh, route, um, oftentimes, um, if the meningium is large, we may consider doing an angiogram uh, and or embolization. An angiogram is, a, is um, a test that looks at the blood vessels of the brain. You have to feed a catheter into the arteries um, in, the, in the cath lab in a special room in the hospital that allows us to do angiograms. And it, we can take pictures of the blood vessels. This is useful if the meningioma is large because large meningiomas can have a very brisk blood supply. Embolization is gluing blood vessels that uh, go to the meningioma. And so this is a way to reduce the blood supply to the meningioma in preparation for surgery. Um, in terms of item number four here, uh, there are some instances where you know, the tumor may be considered to be a meningioma, um, but 
things are not perfectly lining up in in terms of radiographic appearance and the radiologist may have some concern that this is not a meningioma. In these instances, usually we do a full body CT scan just to make sure there's not some other type of tumor elsewhere in the body and that what we're seeing in the brain is not some manifestation of that. Um, and then last, um, you know, evaluations vary from center to center. I think it's very important for an evaluation to be performed at a high volume center, meaning a center that sees and treats a large number of meningiomas, because that, that way you can ensure that you're getting a very thorough um, evaluation and assessment before moving over to the management side. So I want to I'm going to talk about the seven steps I like to think about when uh, when and when approaching um, a meningioma tumor. And uh, I'm going to have um, talk about each of these seven steps in detail, but you can see the list here. So number one, what is the size of your meningioma? You know, is it large? Is it small? How does that influence what we do? Number two, are you having symptoms? Um, sometimes the symptoms can be fairly subtle. So this often takes a little bit of, of digging around um, to really find out what's going on. Conversely, you can have some symptoms that may be unrelated to the meningioma uh, and separating out what is potentially related to the tumor and what is un unrelated is important. Number three, how concerned are you as the patient about achieving symptom resolution? Like what symptoms can you live with and what symptoms can you not live with? Uh, how concerned are you about the pathology report? We'll spend a, some time talking about that. Um, this interestingly varies a lot from patient to patient in terms of whether they want the pathology or not. Um, number five, what's your age? And uh, we're not gonna just talk about chronologic age, like we're gonna talk about your physiologic age. How, how healthy is your body? You know, there are some, some patients that um, are very healthy and they look and, and appear and have uh, um, health substantially younger than their chronologic age. Um, number six, what are your comorbidities? Uh, comorbidities are other medical disorders that a patient can have in parallel with their meningioma. So do you have underlying heart disease? Do you have dementia? Um, do you have cancer? And, and, and is the meningioma like unrelated from that? So we'll talk a little bit about comorbidities and how that influences the decision-making um, and then last is, is, are you taking any medications or supplements, or do you have any other medical disorders that might impact the speed of the growth of the meningioma? Because this is, this is important as well. Okay, so let's talk about step one. You're assessing the size of the meningioma. So this is probably the, the easiest step for a patient to understand because when you get your scans, uh, the radiologists conveniently provide measurements of your meningioma. So um, we use the metric system, so it's gonna usually appear in, in centimeters. Uh, and it's very clear if somebody has a five centimeter tumor, the meningioma, that's larger than a one centimeter tumor. We can kind of put that in perspective. Um, so there, there are some patients that are their meningioma is, is small. So in fact, some are very tiny. Um, usually these are found as incidental findings when you're working up another diagnosis. You know, a patient is seen in the emergency room after automobile accident and they obtain a um, scan of their brain just to make sure there's no injury, fracture, or, 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 or trauma related to the accident. And lo and behold, there's a small meningioma sitting there that the patient didn't even know anything about. So when, when meningiomas are small, they often don't cause any symptoms. So steps two and three about, you know, what are your symptoms and can you live with the symptoms may, may not apply in this case. Um, but we can con compare that in contrast to large meningiomas. So large meningiomas, these are the group that are much more likely to, to cause problems. Uh, I use a one, one third rule in, in explaining these to patients. Um, if you have a symptomatic meningioma, one third of the time the tumor will be symptomatic from headaches. Um, one third of the time the tumor will be symptomatic from by causing seizures. 
And the final one third of the time, the meningeum will be symptom, symptomatic by causing progressive neurologic deficits. And that's just a medical term, basically meaning that the, the patient is having some neurologic symptoms generally related to the location of the brain in which the tumor is, is, is adjacent to. So if you have a meningioma close to the language area of the brain, your progressive neurologic deficit might consist of speech difficulty. If you have a meningioma located um, in close to the movement area of the brain, your progressive neurologic deficit may be gradual onset of, of weakness. So um, generally, generally, for the most part, these are the three most common types of symptoms. So un unless you are kind of really elderly um, at the extreme, a uh, extreme of age, or unless you have significant comorbidities, if you have a symptom symptomatic meningioma, we usually start talking about treatment. Okay, so uh, the second step is um, is what uh, symptoms, um, if any, are are you having um, for your your meningioma? So this is this is important to to talk about and, and walk through. So if you are not having any symptoms, and uh, therefore your meningioma is asymptomatic. That may allow you a little, bit, a lot more time for observation. We know when treating meningiomas, we have the option of observation, surgery, or radiation. And observation just involves obtaining periodic MRI scans to make sure the tumor is not changing in size. So, if you're not having any symptoms, it it really opens the door for potentially a longer window of of observation. Keep in mind that during observation, the tumor has the potential to grow and cause symptoms. Uh, but generally, we have some sort of estimate of, of when that will occur based on the size of, of the tumor on the scan. Now, what about um, those tumors that are meningioma tumors that are causing uh, symptoms? So these are the symptomatic meningiomas. I think we need to have a kind of a, a discussion with the patient, and we need the patient to provide an honest evaluation about the extent of symptoms. Sometimes the patients um, really downplay the symptoms. They'll say, I've been having headaches, but you know, I've had headaches for years and these are not, not too, too much different. Um, sometimes the patients will kind of really overcall the symptoms, meaning every, every symptom they have from you know, dry eye to arthritis, everything now is attached to the meningioma. And that can cloud the picture if, 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 we assign symptoms to a, the meningioma tumor that aren't really related to the tumor. So we, we like to think, you know, how bad are these symptoms? Um, sometimes the patient can answer that question very well. Sometimes they can't. If, they, if they're having difficulty answering that question, you know, how bad are your symptoms? Because it's hard to put a number on some of these. I try to ask it in several different ways. How much of your quality of life is being impacted? Are you not able to do the things that you previously could do? Um, and are you not traveling because you're worried about seizures? Are you not spending time doing your hobbies because you're having so many headaches? Um, so I try to get a, a sense of, of the impact on the quality of life in terms of assessing how bad their symptoms are. Sometimes you get mixed messages. A patient will say, my symptoms are not that bad, but I've stopped you know, leaving the home because I get headaches and seizures. Okay, that, that, that's a little bit of a disconnect there. We need to sort that out. And then I also try to really assess with how long a patient can put up with, with these symptoms. Sometimes uh, pay, you ask a patient, you know, hey, you have headaches. Are you able to manage with the headaches? And they'll say, sure, you know, I can, these headaches are not bad. I can deal with them. But they're often thinking of, well, what were my headaches like last week? What were my headaches like last month? Really, what we're trying to assess is if you're, let's say, a 50-year-old patient and we think you've got another five decades of life, are you going to be able to put up with the headaches for the next 50 years or so? And that can be challenging for patients to fully comprehend because it's it's difficult to think that far out. It's difficult to know really what is acceptable that far out. If you ask patients, can you put up, put up with headaches for a week? Most people will say yes. If you ask patients, can you put up with severe headaches for 25 years? Most patients will probably say no. So 
this how long can you put up with the symptoms is is important in assessing really what strategies you should use to manage the tumor. So related to step two is this step three is is how important is it to as part of your treatment for your meningioma for us to get the symptoms to resolve. Okay, so if you have headaches, it, it is is it critical that we try to eliminate the headaches completely, even if it involves a more invasive option? Or can you live with low-grade headaches um, and choose a less invasive option? So I think this is, is uh, an important question. And again, I try to focus more on the longer term. You know, how important is it for us to get rid of your headaches over the next decades that you're going to be alive? If you're having seizures, are you are the seizures 100% controlled with medications or are you still having seizures despite medications? Are you having side effects from these medications? Seizure medications normally cause patients to feel tired. Um, some, sometimes a patients report feeling foggy in a cognitive standpoint, and those are typically related to medications. So are you, is that, is that side effect acceptable? Um, if the side effects are impacting your lifestyle, are those also acceptable? So we have to really figure out in each patient is how important is it for symptom resolution? And obviously the worse the symptoms, the more likely we wanna get them to resolve, but this is, is um, can be a little bit of a challenging question because we're trying to, again, think down the line. So we, we tell the patient, try to imagine the difference you know, over the next 20 years with living with the symptoms versus living without the symptoms. Because the answer to that question is going to have a big impact on which treatment route we would recommend. Okay. Step four um, that I always think about and have a discussion with the patient is how important is it for you to know the true pathology of, of this presumed meningioma? So most tumors that look like a meningioma in the MRI scan are in fact meningiomas. But there's occasional tumors that are not meningiomas that can look like a meningioma. They have the same appearance, but they're not meningiomas. You know, they're not very common, but how important is it to know about those occurrences? Even if you knew it was a meningioma, we know that most meningiomas are benign, up to 90% are what we would consider a grade one meningioma, the slowest growing, most benign meningioma. But what about the less common, more aggressive meningiomas? You know, one to 2% of meningiomas are considered grade three, faster growing, considered a malignancy. How important is it for you to get pathology to find out about whether you're in that 1%? Um, because obtaining pathology obviously means open surgery. It means that we would not go down the route of using radiation. Um, if you need to obtain pathology, we're certainly not going to observe the, the meningioma. So um, I find out patients kind of fall into one of two categories. There are some patients that want to know with 100% certainty the pathology of their meningioma. Um, and there's other patients that will say, well, you know, if you're 95% certain that it's a meningioma, that's a good enough number for me if it means I can avoid a more invasive surgical option and go with radiation. Um, it's very interesting. I've seen patients um, have different perspective when it comes to getting pathology in the brain than getting pathology in other parts of the body. If you have a, a lump in, the, in your breast, and if you're in your woman, it's very common for biopsy to be done to get tissue diagnosis for pathology. We really wouldn't even think anything, you know, is, is abnormal about that. If males, as they develop enlarged prostate glands, and we're trying to decide, do you have just a regular enlarged prostate that's benign or you have prostate cancer, we always do a biopsy. Um, but when it comes to the brain, the biopsy of the tissue involves opening up the skull. And so it's a bigger deal. And so where someone would not accept a one, two or 5% uncertainty with a lump in the breast, those same people are actually willing to accept that small level of uncertainty when it comes to obtaining pathology in the brain. So the fifth step is to factor in your age. Um, what may be the best option at one age may not be the best treatment option at another age. And I mentioned in the beginning, chronologic age 
may not be as important as, as your physiologic age. Um, there's some people that have done an, either an amazing job, uh, you know, to, you know in maintaining good health, or they just have good genes in their family and everybody in their family lives to over 100. Um, you know, we want to factor that into the equation. And essentially, what we're trying to understand is how many more years, um, uh, uh, you know, are, are you going to be surviving? Because that determines really um, how aggressively we should be with management. If you have headaches and you're 100 years old, it may not make sense to do any big aggressive surgery because you're not going to have to manage headaches for 50 years at that age. But certainly the younger you are as a patient, the more it's going to make sense to um, come up with treatments that may alleviate symptoms because otherwise you'd have to be putting up with the symptoms for a much longer duration of time. The sixth step is to factor in any any other comorbidities. Um, this is more of a, a I would think, a, a challenge for the physicians. Um, you know, as neurosurgeons, you tend to kind of get a you can get a tunnel vision. We're focusing on your meningioma. Uh, we're not worried about you know your asthma or your high cholesterol or anything like that. But but for some diseases, we should be. So depending upon what your other medical issues are at the present. The meningioma may not even be your highest priority on your healthcare list. And I kind of put three issues here that I think, you know, can come into play. If you if you have active cancer, um, really that should be the priority, not managing a, a benign tum tumor like a meningioma. If you have significant cardiac issues and based upon your heart disease, um, you know, that, you know, you're, you're short of breath, you have difficulty climbing stairs, you have heart failure, though that that may impact your quality of life much more than the meningioma, and we shouldn't lose focus on that. And then if you have, you know, really end stage dementia, I'm, I'm talking about kind of, you know, significantly impaired Alzheimer's patients, you know, they may not even be able to factor in that they have a meningioma based upon their, um, their um, cognitive level. Um, the, the last step, step number seven is to consider any medications, supplements, or disorders that could influence the growth of your meningioma. We know, for example, that birth control pills can increase potentially in some patients the speed at which their meningioma grows. It's not clear exactly why this is the case. We do know that many meningiomas have estrogen and progesterone receptors on them, and it's you know, simplistically thought that the hormonal environment when you're taking birth control pills can stimulate the meningioma and make it want to grow a little bit faster than otherwise. The same argument applies for hormone replacement therapy. You're providing you know, female hormones, estrogen and progesterone that may stimulate the growth of the meningioma. We also know that pregnancy, again, likely related to hormonal changes, may influence the speed at which a meningioma grows. And uh, elevated growth hormone uh, can speed up the, the uh, growth of a meningioma. And growth hormone can be elevated from a tumor, for example, in the pituitary gland. Uh, th that's a gland that makes a number of hormones, including growth hormone. And I've seen patients with a pituitary tumor that makes extra growth hormone, and it causes a meningioma in a different part of the brain to, to, to grow at a faster rate than we would expect. Um, also taking growth hormone supplements, um, you know, that's not that common, but, you know, some of the younger patients take that. Those, those can stimulate uh, meningiomas to grow more quickly than normal. So I want to um, kind of walk you through some cases. So, so this is a younger patient. Let's say um, the patient's 40 years old. Um, they have a large tumor. This would be about a five centimeter meningioma. It's compressing the brain. Um, they're having symptoms. Their symptoms are pretty bad headaches. Um, causes them to miss work um, multiple times a month. Uh, and um, they're concerned about pathology. Um, they're 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 considering you know um, uh, going on hormone replacement therapy because they're starting to hit menopause. So in this patient, if you kind of walk through those steps, this patient has a lot of reason to have the meningioma removed with surgery. Um, they're they're the tumor's large, the tumor's causing symptoms, 
the patients saying they cannot live with their symptoms long term and surgery is the best way to alleviate their symptoms. The patient's needs because of uh, menopausal symptoms wants to go on hormonal replacement therapy. You know, so that these are factors that would say when I see that as a whole picture, uh, I would say, look, you're you're better off probably having this tumor removed. And this is another view of the tumor. And this, again, this patient, um, we did exactly what we just kind of walked through is they wanted the tumor removed. And you can see the surgery, the tumor has been removed. And not only that, but the brain has shifted over and filled in all the space that the meningioma um, took for this patient. Okay, let's talk about another patient. This is a patient with a, a much smaller meningioma. This is called olfactory groove uh, meningioma here. Um, and here's, a, here's it on, a, on a, a different view of what we call the coronal view or the vertical view. So this patient um, is um, a patient who's also young, um, but the tumor is small. And this patient's not having any symptoms at all. So you don't really have to query them on their symptoms. They're not really concerned about you know, whether symptoms go away or not go away because they don't have any. Um, this patient's not concerned about pathology, um, doesn't feel that we need to get tissue, especially if it's going to involve an open surgery. So this case would be a, um, a good case to consider uh, radiation or stereotactic radiosurgery. Why? Um, you know, the patient's young. Um, certainly the tumor may grow over time and may grow from a non-symptomatic tumor to one that's causing a lot of symptoms. And we would hate to miss the window to treat this non-invasively when we had that opportunity. Um, they didn't feel the strong need to get pathology. The patient's, you know, feels comfortable with the, the statistics that this looks like a meningioma and most meningiomas are benign. So there's no need to get tissue. So using a non-invasive treatment such as, um, you know, stereotactic radiosurgery in our institution, we use the cyber knife and to do that make, makes a good option for this patient. Uh, here's the, the third and final case I want to uh, talk to you. This patient is um, 85 years old um, and has uh, had, had this tumor um, that you can see right here, this little white, white streak, uh, was uh, diagnosed on an MRI scan um, as they uh, were worked up for memory loss. So um, the tumor is small. Um, it's not related to the memory loss. So this the tumor is asymptomatic from the aspect of the meningioma. We don't have to worry about symptoms getting better. The patient is comfortable with the statistics, doesn't feel they need to have pathology. Um, they have a lot of other comorbidities. They're, they're having memory issues, um, starting to have dementia. So we want to factor that into the equation. And also they're, they're in their 80s. So um, age-wise, um, you know, um, puts it into a situation where we might not, not want to consider any invasive option. So in this case, we would say no surgery is needed. Um, you might say, well, what about the issue with radiation? Well, you know, the patient has other issues, other medical issues, um, and they're not having any symptoms. So in this case, the patient can say, I want to just observe this. And we'll say, let's get another scan in a, in a year and we can address this if it changes. Many meningiomas don't change uh, over a shorter interval, like six months or a year. So in an elderly patient with other medical problems, it certainly makes reasonable sense to consider uh, observation here. I do want to talk, uh, I was, um, have a couple of slides on, on you know, the kind of the, the growth rate of meningiomas. And I don't, I don't want anybody to worry, this is not going to be complex calculus or anything like that. But um, generally, if we think of a meningioma as, as a round ball, you know, as a sphere, we know that the volume of the sphere is, um, is, can be calculated based upon this geometric formula here. And the key, the key part of the formula to look at is the radius or the, the diameter. It's the cube root of the radius. So as the, the meningioma grows by volume, it's going to grow at, at the cube root of the radius. And what does this mean? So if you look at the bottom of this screen here, if you have a one centimeter diameter tumor, you, you're going to have a, 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 actually, this is a one centimeter radius tumor. You're going to have a volume of four centimeters. Now, if the diameter goes to two centimeters or the radius goes to two centimeters, the volume is going to go from four centimeters, cubic centimeters to 32. 
So this is where patients can kind of get a little bit misled by the measurements. Your tumor did not go from one to two, which is a double. Your tumor went from four to 32, which is a factor of eight. And if your meningioma goes from one centimeter radius to three centimeters of radius, the volume actually goes up by a factor of 27. So you can see a small change in the diameter or the radius of the tumor can result in a much larger change of the volume of the tumor, which is actually what you would have to either remove with surgery or treat with radiation. So it's important to pay attention to the how, how fast the volume of the tumor is changing, not just the, the diameter and radius. Okay, so remember Paul, he's a law student from the beginning who had his uh, meningioma. He was really stressed out because he didn't understand kind of the, 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 the steps to walk through the management. So after talking with his doctor and understanding the various steps, he realized that, you know, he wasn't really having a lot of, a lot of symptoms right now. He feels much more confident and empowered in making decisions because he took time to understand the uh, factors that were important in, in, in evaluating his meningioma. So I'm gonna um, stop here and um, answer questions. If you have questions, um, you can enter them in the question and answer um, box um, that's um, on the screen and I'll try to answer them in the order in which they come in. And I'll read the question off to everybody so they can uh, see the question. So the first question is, um, what is considered a small meningioma? And that, that's a very good question because size depends, the, the, the answer to that question depends upon the, um, the location of the tumor. A, if you have a tumor over the kind of what we call the, the frontal lobe or the, the front part of the brain, a, a small one centimeter tumor is gonna be minuscule. It won't be causing any problems. But if you have a one centimeter tumor around the vision nerves, um, behind the eye, that would be considered large for, for that area. Um, so, so size is relative to location. The other um, way that we kind of consider size is when it comes to stereotactic radiation or using focused radiation for meningiomas, we, we typically have a size cutoff for the radiation. Um, Historically, it's been three centimeters in diameter, maximal diameter. We've now been able to treat larger meningiomas with radiation up to, let's say, four centimeters, depending upon um, what kind of symptoms the patient is having. Um, but, you know, three centimeters is probably a reasonable arbitrary cutoff between, you know, small small and, and big um, and, and for, for most locations. Um, the uh, second question is um, going to be um, what if any meningioma uh, of the brain, oh, so what if the meningioma of the brain is adjacent to nerves, such as the auditory nerves? Um, you know, that, that's a great question. Meningiomas are located outside technically of the brain tissue. They're inside the skull, but outside the brain. So um, the, the problem is the space between the brain and the skull often has a number of blood vessels and nerves traversing that location. Um, one of the common areas for a meningioma is called this, the CP angle or the cerebellopontine angle. And tumors, meningiomas in this location can be adjacent to the auditory nerve, which is the hearing nerve. Um, if the tumors are small and the symptoms are either minimal or tolerable, then um, the you, you can certainly use radiation on this if you want to treat the tumor. Um, smaller tumors can can be managed with with radiation very well and saves you from having the surgery. Um, if the tumor is large and then around those nerves, generally we we recommend at least a surgical debulking. The challenge with surgery in this location is the risk of impacting the nerves. The auditory nerve, the hearing nerve is very sensitive to manipulation. And um, you know, even a kind of a one centimeter tumor, when you resect that tumor in this location, if it's wrapped around the auditory nerves, is you know, not an unreasonable probability of losing hearing. So you know, that's a concern in that location. 
Next question is, how does a person get diagnosed if they don't have any symptoms? Um, so you would be diagnosed as a part of what we call an incidental finding. So I, I used a couple of examples in the presentation. You had a car accident, you know, so you got a scan and they found a meningioma. You, um, you um, had some symptoms that you thought were unrelated, like I, I have headaches and I don't know what's going on. Um, the headache's been going on for two or three years. I'm not really a headache type of person. And my primary care physician said, get a scan. Well, okay, I got diagnosed with a meningioma. I, I, in retrospect, I had symptoms, but I wasn't connecting them to possibly having a brain tumor. Um, for the most part, um, uh, you know, the uh, person gets diagnosed without symptoms as part of a workup for a di different issue. You know, um, Sam is 85 years old and has memory problems. So we're getting an MRI scan to look for Alzheimer's disease and lo and behold, we found a meningioma. You know, that, that, that's possible. Um, so the next question was, um, um, the patient is 36 years old. Um, doctors say radiation is not a good idea, um, but the tumor is one centimeter and, and adjacent to the auditory nerve. Um, it's difficult to answer that question without looking at the films, um, but I can tell you that um, radiation um, is, is, is certainly very easy to do in young patients. Um, the surgery, the, the challenge with surgery, and I'm speaking as a, as a neurosurgeon that spends half my practice in the operating room doing open surgery and half my practice doing radiation. So I'm very comfortable talking about both aspects. The problem with surgery on a young patient is that if there's any complication from the surgery, the younger patient has to live with those complications for a much longer period of time. So if you have surgery for a tumor that's adjacent to the hearing nerve and you lose hearing as a result of 30 and you're 36 years old, for the next 70 years of your life, you won't have hearing. So in a younger patient, the stakes of, the, the stakes of surgery are much higher. Um, but generally, um, there's no contraindication to radiation in younger patients. And um, I, I think based on the films, I still think that radiation may be a good option um, for a one centimeter tumor in the back of the head. The next question is, um, I have a 3% tumor left adjacent to my optic nerve after having surgery. Sounds like the tumor started out at 4.4 centimeters, about an inch and a half. I have 3% of the tumor left after surgery. This will be treated with radiation. Um, what are the risks of this uh, of the second treatment? Should the radiation not kill the remaining, um, uh, um, I don't know if it means nerve or tumor. So I'm going to speak to both aspects. Generally, if you have 3% of the tumor left and it's visible and it's close to a critical structure like the optic nerve, it, it's certainly reasonable to treat this with radiation to, um, to try to prevent you from needing to have a second surgery. I think the last thing you'd want if you had a, had a surgery for removal of a large tumor is to need a second surgery. And if radiation provides an outpatient, non-invasive way to avoid a second surgery, that, that should be really strongly considered. And that's kind of what I would do if this were, were me. Um, now, if the radiation doesn't control this 3% of the tumor and the tumor grows, um, then it's wide open to debate in terms of what the next step is. Sometimes it's going to be a, a second course of radiation. Sometimes it may be another recommendation for a smaller surgery. It's really going to be dependent upon you know, age, symptoms, how fast the tumor is changing, uh, comfort level of the patient and the surgeon there. So there's kind of not a, not a concrete way I can answer that, that question um, about the tumor. Now, with respect to the optic nerve, this is where the, your tumor is located next to the optic nerve. That's, that's the vision nerve. There's a chance that the radiation may impact the optic nerve, which could result in vision loss. But I do think you're much more likely to have vision loss related to tumor regrowth than you are from the radiation. So I think your biggest threat to your optic nerve and your vision is regrowth of the tumor, not, not radiation. Okay, and, I, and the same, same person that we just talked about, they have a grade two meningioma. And um, as I mentioned, grade two, those tumors tend to grow a little bit faster. Ideally, we, we wanna, wanna get them all with surgery and radiation so we don't uh, leave opportunity for them to grow. 
Um, so the next question, is there some new technology or device that can remove meningiomas in a difficult spot like the back of the brain? So, um, you know, there's not, so it, really the mainstays are going to be surgery and radiation. Let's break those down one at, one at a time. With radiation, radiation technology always advances. It's every year because you get software upgrades to the radiation machines, just no different than upgrades on your Mac or Windows computer. So um, there's always going to be, you know, a, a newer version of software next year than there is this year. Um, having said that, the technology and the software doesn't change enough that it it's worth waiting if you got a tumor that needs to be treated. Um, in terms of, of surgical options, um, surgery is a lot different than radiation and it uses the actual, you know, um, the abilities of the surgeon's hands. And, and really in, I've always felt strongly that the success of the surgery is less related to the, whether you have this tool or that tool, but more related to the ability and the skill of the surgeon. How much experience do they have? Are they comfortable treating meningiomas? Have they treated a lot type of your tumor? Um, the the success rate for surgical resection more and more is related to the skill of the surgeon rather than the type of tool that they use. Um, so the next question is regarding choosing radiation um, versus surgery. Um, the um, you know the, the the person asks, what's the chance of developing cancer from the radiation? Um, and this person was told that one percent of patients who get radiation will develop cancer from that radiation treatment. Um, you're, you know, you don't specify the type of radiation. There's two types of radiation. There's conventional radiation, and then there's stereotactic radio surgery, which is the focused radiation. Um, I typically treat tumors with the focused radiation, what's called stereotactic radio surgery. And with that treatment, the risk of uh, a radiation-induced malignancy is probably about one in 10,000, not one in 100. Um, and that's one in 10,000 over the lifetime of, of the patient. Um, you also have to compare that with surgery, the, what's the risk of surgery. When you do surgery on meningiomas, there's probably you know, one in 500 chance of, of dying from the surgery. So would you rather have a one in 10,000 probability over your remaining lifetime or one in 500 chance this year of dying from surgery. I think if you look at it from that aspect, radiation is often much less riskier than surgery. Um, and I found that people that kind of give these very generalized numbers, like it's a very convenient 1% number that you quoted, um, are people that don't do both aspects. Um, I think you mentioned that this doctor was a radiation oncologist that quoted this number. You really probably need to talk to somebody that um, does both the radiation and the surgery to get a true comparison. A radiation oncologist has not done a single surgical procedure in their life, so they have a little bit of hard time comparing apples to oranges when they only have an apple in their hand. Uh, but I think that one percent number that you're quoted is 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 way too high. Um, the next question is, would you have symptoms from a six millimeter tumor? Um, and the um, question is, is it better to get it out now when the tumor is small? Um, so, um, and then kind of, there's a second question of that that says, if you did get symptoms and then had surgery, what's the probability that the symptoms would go away? So let's break these down. There's actually three questions here. Um, if you have a six millimeter tumor, the question of whether you would have symptoms or not have symptoms is dependent upon location of the tumor. There's lots of areas in the brain where a six millimeter tumor would not cause any symptoms at all. And there's other more critical areas of the brain down by the hearing nerve, by the vision nerve, um, where a six millimeter tumor certainly could cause symptoms. So it really depends on location. You'd have to look at the films um, for me to give you a better, more concrete answer than, than, than that. Now, if you don't have symptoms, is it better to get it out before the symptoms occur? You know, this is the probably the most critical de decision point when it comes to managing a meningioma. If you wait and you kick the can down the road, you risk the tumor growing and you risk new symptoms developing. 
And then if you try to treat at that point, you're now dealing with a bigger tumor, potentially a lower success rate in controlling the tumor. And even if you did treat that tumor successfully, I, I always like to say that whatever symptoms you have coming into treatment is your baseline. So if you come in for treatment, either with radiation or surgery, and you have no symptoms at all, that's your baseline. We want to keep you there. We, we, we expect most patients in that situation to come out with no symptoms from their treatment. Now, if you have a bunch of symptoms, I'm having headaches and things like that, um, that that's your baseline. If we treat the tumor, there's a chance the symptoms may go away. There's a chance the symptoms may stick around. There's always a small chance the symptoms might even get worse. But your 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 best, the patients that do the best are the patients that that get treated before they have symptoms. If you wait till you have symptoms, we can't necessarily always turn back the clock and 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 fix damage to the brain related to the tumor. You know, you can't put the horse back in the barn all the time. Okay, next question says, Doctor Landis says radiation is risky. That's a uh, vague and misleading statement. I, I would say that the um, for for many types of meningiomas, um, radiation is actually the less risky treatment um, for many types of meningiomas. For example, uh, cavernous sinus meningiomas are almost never treated with surgery because they're in an area where there's too many nerves and the carotid artery, and surgery is much likely to cause significant neurologic deficits such as double vision, facial weakness, weakness in the arms or legs. So um, there's the, the, this is an overgeneralized statement by saying your radiation is risky. I would disagree with that pretty strongly. Um, the next question is, could you address uh, jugular frame and skull base tumors? Um, the size of the tumor is two centimeters by 1.3 by 1.3 centimeters. Um, knowing that the risk of operating near critical structure poses a challenge, what are the long-term effects of stereotactic radiosurgery? Um, so uh, again, it really depends. If you're not having symptoms, um, the likelihood that you would develop symptoms even after stereotactic radiosurgery is very low. So if you're describing a scenario where you feel great, no symptoms at all, I, I think radiosurgery could still be a very good option here. Again, really depends on, on the films here. We can't kind of overly generalize recommendations on webinars without seeing films. Um, but if you're not having symptoms, radiosurgery is still, still in play here. Now, if you are having symptoms, um, then the story is different. And we get back to the argument, what are your symptoms? Can you live with the symptoms? If not, you should have surgery. If you can live with the symptoms, um, then you know, radiation is still potentially on the table. The question about swelling and pushing on the brain, um, that, that certainly is a valid argument, but it doesn't happen in most patients. So the way that I typically address a tumor like this is I would tell a patient, we could do radio surgery. Um, and then if you're in the 5% where we develop some swelling, then you might need to have regular surgery to decompress a tumor and get the, get the pressure off the brain. Now that, now that sounds like, well, you just told me I need to have two procedures instead of one, and that's not exactly the case. There's a 95% chance roughly for most tumors of this size that are at the jugular frame and that we can get you through the radio surgery treatment throughout without any problems at all. So we're only talking about 5% of the patients will need a plan B here. Um, and then the, looks like the, the person that wrote this question clarifies a CP angle meningioma extending into the jugular frame. And, you know, the, this, these tumors, you know, there are a lot of nerves in, the, in that area. So, um, oftentimes what I would do for some of these skull based meningiomas is consider a hybrid approach, um, where you do, um, both surgery and radio surgery. Um, so it turns out for most meningiomas, uh, the vast majority of the tumor could be removed with low risk. It's the last 10 to 15% of the tumor that's associated with the highest uh, risk of surgery. So if you, combine surgery to remove 80% of the tumor with radio surgery to radiate the last 20%. Oftentimes that's the, that may be less risky than, than going all one or going all, all another um, with either surgery alone or radiation alone. Um, uh, the next person says, um, is there a doctor or hospital in USA that deals with brain meningiomas? 
Um, so this is um, that's a very good question. So I, you know, I, I I serve on kind of medical advisory boards for a number of medical associations, and really what I've seen the best the best answer to this question is is uh, is can can be answered several different ways. I I do think it's important for um, patients to be treated at what we call a high volume center or a center of excellence when it comes to meningiomas. You definitely want a center that's seeing hundreds of meningiomas a year that does both surgery and radio surgery um, because they'll know they would have, have the best chance of seeing a tumor exactly like yours before and knowing how they managed it and, and, and treated it. Um, I do think it's important to um, you know, meningiomas, because they're benign, you have the opportunity to not make a hasty decision and the opportunity to get multiple opinions. Um, because um, essentially, managing the meningioma is not a one-time event. You're not going to just come in to see the doctor once and that's it. You're likely to get to establish a long-term relationship with the, the doctor managing your meningioma. And it's very important that you feel comfortable with that person. So whether it's a gut instinct comfort level, or you really agree with the philosophy, or you, you like the um, completeness for which the, um, you know, the, the treatment is being offered to you is explained, that that's really what what you um, what you're looking for. And you're correct, it's scary deciding on this, because you're you're trusting, you know, probably the most important part of your human body to somebody to to take care of you for that aspect. And, um, you know, this is, this is kind of one of the reasons why we, we have these support groups and have these webinars is to try to just educate as many patients as possible on kind of the thought process and managing the meningiomas. Um, but, but, um, there's not kind of one leading hospital or one leading doctor. Um, but I would say, look for a medical center that has, um, you know, a very focused, meningioma center, you know, that like does that their medical center have a special meningioma center of excellence? Um, do they, you know, talk about their outcomes? Do they talk about the different treatment options that they have? Um, uh, the next question was, um, um, you know, I guess the same, same person talked about um, Mayo Clinic, Hopkins, Duke. Yeah, those are all, all large academic centers should have a pretty comprehensive ability to manage um, meningiomas. Um, so uh, again, at that level, you know, at, the, at that level of of care, you're you're going to have all the bells and whistles, and I think then it just boils down to comfort level with you and the physician. Like, does your kind of philosophy and outlook mesh with theirs? Um, you know, when you get to when you're getting to that that level. Um, the next question: Do you use fully fractionated radiation instead of SRS, which is stereotactic radio surgery in some cases. Um, so, so I should technically the technically in 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 neurosurgery, SRS is anywhere from one to five fractions. So when you talk about SRS, you're talking about up to five fractions of radiation, not not just a single fraction. So size is a consideration um, to determine how many sessions we use. The other factor is proximity to critical structures. Um, so our, you know, if the tumor is close to the vision nerve, for example, we may fractionate. If it's close to the brain stem, we may fractionate. Um, you know, so we, we take into consideration size and um, location when determining um, fractionation regimen. Um, next uh, question. Um, the um, I have a very well-rounded mass centered at the CP angle facing the porous acousticus with mild enhancement along the IEC margin. Um, so yeah, this is a lot of, a lot of um, uh, um, kind of medical and anatomic terms here. So the CP angle is, um, is, is, um, a location in the back of the head, kind of behind the ear. The porous acousticus is the internal ear. You know, when you have the your ear on the outside, the what we call the external auditory canal, it's where you stick the Q-tip in and clean the ear. There's a there's another part of the canal that's on the inside, and that's called the porous acousticus, and that's where meningiomas can can grow there. And um, 
the this location, the tumor is going to be very close to both the hearing nerve, the balance nerves, and the nerve that controls movement of the face. Um, so if the tumor is small in this location, I typically recommend going with stereotactic radiosurgery because open surgery for a small tumor runs some risk of injuring those nerves unnecessarily when you have a non-invasive option. If the tumor is large in this location, you may not have too much of a chance um, to avoid surgery. Um, but typically, for the most part, tumors in this location are good targets for stereotactic uh, radiosurgery. Um, the next question is, I've had multiple consults. All neurosurgeons spoke about the approach that you mentioned, subtotal resection and radiosurgery. However, their neurotologist, co-surgeon, all recommend the watch and wait approach. Have you had that experience? Okay, so um, yeah, this is the this is the problem when you get multiple opinions is they may not all um, be the same. In, in a perfect world, if all the doctors said the same thing, you would have a lot more confidence that that you're making the correct treatment decision. Um, in reality, there is no one correct treatment decision here. Um, it in order to optimally pick the correct treatment decision, you'd have to have a crystal ball and be able to predict the future. You know, know how long you're gonna live, how fast the tumor is gonna grow, whether you're gonna develop any other cancers in your lifetime, you know, um, things like that. It's, it's, it's impossible to really have a crystal ball in the future. And so um, physicians all have their own biases. Um, oftentimes the biases are not based on, on any hard and fast science. Um, you know, maybe it's something as simple as the neuroautologist who recommended the wash and wait has been maybe watching a couple other meningiomas and saw them in clinic last month and none of them grew. So he's like, yep, watch and wait's the way to go. Um, it's possible the neurosurgeon, maybe the last two or three meningiomas he's followed that got bigger and now he's worried about he doesn't want to, you know, be in the same situation again. So you're going to, I think it's, in, if, if these two surgeons um, are at the same institution, um, which it sounds like they are, it may be worthwhile getting an opinion at a, at a, at a different institution um, because the same, you know, the, these two surgeons at the same institution likely are on the same team and would be the, on the same surgical team uh, that would, would address this tumor if you had to have surgery. And you can already see the challenge here. You got a neurosurgeon and a neurotologist they're both going to work together on removing your tumor at surgery, but they have difference in opinions on, on what they're supposed to do. So it's a little bit of a problem in that the surgical team has a different philosophical approach among the different team members. Um, ideally, you want a situation where everybody on your team is going is, is kind of advocating for you in the same direction, because I think that reduces a lot of the, the anxiety that can happen there. Okay, I think I got through... 20 questions or close to 20 questions. Um, they're all great questions, by the way. Um, uh, okay, one more question. Um, I'm glad you mentioned a surgical team approach. Do all hospitals have a team? Um, not all hospitals have a team. Uh, the larger academic centers will, should have a, a team that works together um, for these type of, of tumors, um, a multidisciplinary team of surgeons, radiation oncologists, possibly neurotologists, possibly, you know, they, you have a neuroradiologist, a, um, you know, even a neuropathologist. Um, so the larger academic hospitals should have a team. Smaller community hospitals, I think it's a little bit more up in the air because it really depends on the size of the, the hospital there. Okay. Any questions? Any other questions? Okay. Um, well, it was a great, great discussion. Um, thank you for um, attending um, tonight. I hope it was helpful, at least to see how uh, I walk through in my mind the thought process of managing uh, meningiomas. Um, if any of you have other questions, um, my email and phone number are on the screen. Um, happy to help in any way possible. I do want to emphasize again that really it's difficult over the web to kind of give like very specific uh, advice because a lot of it is really based upon the pictures. Um, you know, what the MRI shows in terms of the tumor size and location and, and is extremely, extremely important to, um, um, 
to make make a more concrete uh, recommendation. So thank you very much, um, and also thank you for uh, Vivo for uh, um, putting together the, the the webinar for everybody to attend. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Have a great evening, everyone.